If you've ever seen Braveheart, Train Spotting, or Groundskeeper Willie on The Simpsons, then you know that the Scottish don't generally love the English. So what happened between these two countries to stir up all that animosity? Well, grab a warm plate of haggis and settle in. Today, we're looking at the way Scotland has been mistreated throughout history. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other historic national beefs you'd like to hear about. Okay, someone fire up the bagpipes. If you only remember one thing about the Roman Emperor Hadrian, it's probably the namesake wall he had built during the second century. If you remember a second thing, it's how funny it would be to imagine Sylvester Stallone yelling his name. Hadrian! Hadrian's wall was a massive symbol of Roman might, composed of forts, mile castles, and turrets, along a timber, dirt, and stone wall of varying widths and heights. The wall extended 73 miles across Britain from the River Tyne in the east to the Solway Firth in the west, attempting to prevent threats like the Picts from raiding Roman Britain. But we bet the neighbor's yappy little dog would still find a way to get over it and fertilize the lawn. The wall worked for a little while, but then, in the year 142, Emperor Antoninus Pius pushed the border of the Roman Empire to a new wall, which he, of course, called the Antonine Wall. The Antonine Wall stood between the rivers Clyde and Forth, and was still intended to stop tribes from menacing the Roman Empire. But it proved less successful than its predecessor, and it's much less funny to imagine Stallone yelling, Antonine! Okay, it's still pretty funny. Roman troops later fell back to Hadrian's Wall and fought off the so-called barbarian tribes until the Romans withdrew from Britain during the 5th century. Whether it was Hadrian's or Antoninus's wall, the Roman British didn't want outsiders, from what is now called Scotland, invading their empire and threatening civilization. In other words, the tension between Scotland and England goes way, way back. After waging war on Wales and building several huge, expensive castles to hold his ground, English King Edward I turned his attention to Scotland, something we imagine didn't really thrill the Scots. Taking advantage of the succession crisis of 1286, Edward arbitrated who could lead Scotland after the death of their King Alexander III, eventually determining John Balliol to be the best candidate. So like the HBO show Succession, but with violence. Well, I guess that would be Game of Thrones. Edward probably expected some gratitude from Balliol. Instead, he felt betrayed when Scotland entered into the Auld Alliance with France in 1296. See, Edward wanted the Scots to fight for him in a war with France, but Balliol was all, je ne sais pas. So in early 1296, a war broke out between England and Scotland over the war between England and France. A war inception, if you will. Long story short, things didn't go too great for Balliol. And by August, Scotland's leading nobles swore loyalty to the English king, pretending they never liked french fries to begin with. This wasn't the end of the wars of Scottish independence, but it was a significant hit to Scotland. The established English parliament taxed the population, Edward's men held castles throughout the country, and the hammer of the Scots, as Edward became known, reigned supreme. During the wars of Scottish independence, William Wallace emerged as a hero for Scotland and a huge career-advancing opportunity for Mel Gibson, but it turned out pretty poorly for both of them. Braveheart isn't remotely close to being historically accurate, but as a leader of the rebellion against England during the late 13th and early 14th centuries, Wallace did successfully outfight Edward I's troops at Stirling Bridge in 1297, becoming known as the very badass-sounding Guardian of the Realm. He also really lost at the Battle of Falkirk in 1298 and resigned from that badass-sounding position, even if that didn't stop him from remaining defiant and unwilling to compromise with the English. Wallace's efforts against England continued until his capture in 1305. Eager to make an example out of him, or possibly mistaking him for some sort of undead monster, the English visited all manner of torture on Wallace and utterly destroyed his corpse, ultimately distributing his body parts throughout Scotland. It was a warning to other Scots that they should know their place. Everyone else, presumably, just had to watch out for falling limbs. When King Henry VIII invaded France in 1513, France's ally Scotland raided England in response, because that's what bros do. Led by King James IV, Scotland supported France as part of the Auld Alliance. 
but abiding by this agreement, James violated the Treaty of Perpetual Peace he had signed with England in 1502. For this, he risked excommunication from the church, which was a pretty huge deal back then. That's a pretty big deal now. A month after crossing into England, 35 to 40,000 of James's men clashed with a force of 26,000 led by the Earl of Surrey. But on September 9, 1513, the Scottish suffered a devastating defeat, losing thousands of men, many nobles, and the king himself. So basically, the worst chess game of all time. They wouldn't even show that on the Ocho. After King James's death, the Scottish retrieved his body from the battlefield, sent him to Berwick, and embalmed his body to lay in a lead coffin, presumably to defend it from enemy X-rays. Then the coffin went to London to be received by Catherine of Aragon, Henry's first wife. Once Henry returned from France, the king was unsure of how to handle James's corpse, especially since he couldn't have a burial on sacred ground due to his excommunication. Even in death, bureaucracy reigned supreme. Henry dealt with his indecision as most of us would have. He threw the body into a woodshed at a monastery and forgot about it. At one point, in some wild foreshadowing to Henry's preferred method of divorce, someone even removed the head, or it just plain fell off. No one really knows for sure. Then, during Henry's dissolution of the monasteries in the 1530s, the body just got lost. But that wasn't the only time a prominent Scottish ruler's bits and pieces got away from them. Mary Stuart was Queen of Scotland until her forced abdication in 1567, where she fled and took refuge with her cousin, Queen Elizabeth, in England. But if she was expecting a warm family welcome from her cuz, she was in for a surprise. Elizabeth, realizing the former Catholic monarch was too dangerous to leave to her own devices, had Mary taken into custody. Drama! Mary spent 19 years under house arrest at the orders of her Protestant cousin. During this time, there were several plots to eliminate Elizabeth, but the Babington plot of 1586 would prove to be Mary's undoing, thanks to letters she exchanged with fellow conspirators. Long story short, Mary had to stand trial for treason and received a death sentence. Sadly, celebrity defense attorneys would not exist for another 400 years. Mary faced her sentence on a scaffold in front of 500 people. A bystander at the execution reported that she endured two strokes with an axe. Eee, what happened there? The whole point of an axe is not to have to hit anything twice. The executioner then lifted up her head to the view of all the assembly and bade God save the queen. That would have made for a pretty dramatic finish, but according to the witness, when the executioner picked up her head, her wig came off, revealing her real hair. A literal wig snatch. The disrespect was palpable. The executioner, red wig in hand, stood by her as her head rolled along the scaffold. And if that hadn't undercut the seriousness of the moment enough, her small dog ran out from under her skirt and began to howl. So yeah, if someone gave your country's leader the Dick Van Dyke show of executions, you'd be sore about it too. England and Scotland merged their governments in 1707 with the Act of Union. Only this so-called merger was more like a hostile corporate takeover. Scotland forfeited any governmental autonomy as it became part of the United Kingdom. Instead, it was given representation at Parliament in London, a wild transition given that Scotland had its own representative body since 1235. In the eyes of many Scots, Scotland's interests weren't being taken seriously under the new system, and they began to miss the old ways. So starting in the 20th century, there were numerous calls to restore the Scottish Parliament. Then, during the 1970s and 80s, the issue of devolution led to the establishment of a constitutional convention and referendum for a new Scottish Parliament, which ultimately passed in 1997. This new Parliament met for the first time in 1999, controlling issues like education, local governance, housing, environment, and agriculture, without those pesky English blokes breathing down their neck. After the Scottish Jacobite Revolt of 1746, the English decided to abolish the threat permanently. Soldiers ravaged the Scottish Highlands, and the English government enacted legal maneuvers to rid clans of their lands and authority. Chiefs had no power, and the crown seized large amounts of land. Most Scots, so used to the structure and traditions of clans, didn't understand what was happening, and many took to the woods, wandering about in a state approaching absolute insanity. And several of them, in this situation, lived only a few days, and several children did not long survive their sufferings. It was dark. The Duchess of Sutherland and her husband led one of the largest efforts to drive out the Scottish, 
moving 15,000 people and replacing them with 200,000 sheep in the weirdest settlers of Catan deal we've ever heard. As this continued throughout the late 18th and 19th centuries, the shift of population from the highland clearances brought an end to clan culture. Jacobite revolts raged in Britain for almost a century, intending to reinstate the Stuart monarchy, because Scotland just loved early 2000s mad TV sketches. Then, in April 1746, the Battle of Culloden took place in what would be the last Scotland-England battle fought on British soil. Prince Charles of Scotland had 6,000 Scottish troops at Culloden, but the Duke of Cumberland's English soldiers were fresher and better armed. Also, and perhaps more crucially, there were 9,000 of them. The Scots suffered a decisive defeat by the English at Culloden and abandoned their efforts on behalf of the Stuarts, looking at what they could do no longer. After the Scottish defeat, many wounded men faced executions, and the Duke of Cumberland and his men hunted down those who fled. Scottish Highlanders sought refuge in the mountains, but the English were relentless. They executed Jacobite supporters, burned their homes, and sent English warships to raid the coasts. Guess they really, really preferred SNL. To bring an end to Gaelic culture, heritage, and tradition, the English government banned tartans with the Act of Prescription of 1746. The Act prohibited anyone from wearing tartans or highland clothes, except for military officials. The punishment for donning plaid, filibeg, or little kilt, trouse, shoulder belts, or any part whatsoever of what peculiarly belongs to the Highland garb was to suffer imprisonment without bail during the space of six months and no longer. Six months in the camp for wearing grunge flannel? That's harsh. If you think six months in prison for violating a dress code sounds unreasonable, then wrap your head around the fact that second-time offenders were liable to be transported to any of His Majesty's plantations beyond the seas, there to remain for a space of seven years. In other words, wearing the wrong outfit could get you enslaved in a foreign land for seven years. Lucky wedding invitations don't carry a similar threat. Does anyone know what garden formal means? The act also disarmed all Highlanders and gave English officials the authority to enter and search Scottish homes to look for weaponry and detain anyone who had in his or their custody use or bear, broadsword or target, poignard, winger or dirk, side pistol, gun, or other warlike weapon. There could no longer be only one. So what do you think? Which other periods of Scottish history would you like to hear about? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.